Good morning, Interweb. This is follow up to my previous video, Flat Planets, if planets were pizzas. If you haven't already seen that video, go check it out. Otherwise, none of this is going to make any sense whatsoever. Bro, I've known the world is round since I was like two. You don't need to try and convince me of the fact every half minute. Just world build, please. Okay, I can't even finish this. This isn't world building. It's just Flat Earther's Pond part 89 quadrillion 342 trillion 984 billion 332 million 890,809. Fracking, no one here thinks the earth is fracking flat. You don't need to flex your incredible intellect by explaining such trivial matters ad nauseum. So yeah, I kind of see where you're coming from here. Although my counter argument would be that the flat earth model is world building. Like the flat earthers have made up this fictitious story and it has suspended the disbelief for like a huge amount of people. That by definition is world building and effective world building. So I really wanted to bring it up. From a science perspective, it's obviously a load of nonsense. So it would have been unethical of me not to point the nonsense out, otherwise like I'm spreading misinformation. So the explicit purpose of the video was not to debunk flat earthers. It was to showcase the flat earth model as world building. And also like, it's just a bit of fun. So if the planet has to be engineered to begin with, wouldn't it be plausible that to get to that level of technological sophistication, the engineers would have long developed anti-grav artificial gravity technology before that point. So they could just use gravity plating along the edges to even out gravity along the entire disc. For sure, you can totally do that. For me though, I don't really enjoy using technology as a sort of cover all problem solver. Because you could always just say, oh, advanced technology made everything better. For me, what I like to do is use advanced technology to do one strange thing, like construct a flat planet, and then deal with the consequences of that sans technological intervention. It kind of follows from Clark's third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think it was Brandon Sanderson said that magic slash technology is best used to create problems as opposed to solve problems. So in summation, using technology to solve these weird quirks is totally fine. I just like to use it very sparingly. Ahem, you do know that in general relativity, gravity also doesn't exist, right? The notion that in general relativity, gravity just simply doesn't exist is just not true. It's more accurate to say that in general relativity, gravity isn't viewed as a force. It's viewed as a consequence of masses moving along geodesic lines in curved space-time. So it's not correct to say that general relativity does away with gravity. And it's also not correct to say that because general relativity does away with gravity, flat earthers doing away with gravity is totally fine. That is not a sound argument whatsoever. A couple of others took issue with me not speaking in terms of general relativity and framing gravity more as a Newtonian mechanic. I get where you're coming from with that, but I think framing gravity in the Newtonian sense is a good enough approximation for like, nearly all cases. Gravity is not a force. Yes, see Veritasium video. But for the most part, we can just talk about it as a force and it's fine. 502, are you saying high above an infinite flat plane Earth, gravity would have the same magnitude as on the ground? I don't see why that would be the case. I think it would still decrease, but maybe not at one over R squared from a fixed point, because you'd be pulled on by a lot of points whose distance increases at different rates. So I will leave a link to a really cool Reddit thread that goes through this. You should check that out. It's going to be more comprehensive than I'm going to be here. So without getting into the maths, here's how I kind of visualize it in my head. I'm standing on the infinite plane. The points directly below my feet are pulling me directly down and all the other points around me are pulling me laterally to some degree. And I record an acceleration due to gravity of X meters per second squared. As I increase in altitude, the gravitational strength of each individual point is weaker as you might expect. But now more points are directly below my feet. So things get canceled out and it's the same with all the laterally pulling points as well. So the effect is that the net gravitational force is constant and independent of altitude. Now that's not a rigorous explanation, it's just how I think about it in my head. Again, check the link's Reddit post if you're interested in digging a bit further. Would could orbital precession on that geocentric model cause consistent mass extinction events? as organisms suited for life in exclusively hot or cold climates struggle to deal with changing temperatures? Or would that cycle be more gradual than I'm imagining? So when I first read this question, I was like, yeah, no, it's gonna be way more gradual than that. No chance of mass extinction events. But I did a little bit of digging and IRL, the Earth's orbital precession follows a 112,000 year cycle, which is remarkably quick and like could well be used as justification for fairly frequent mass extinction events. This is one of those questions where the answer inevitably is going to be less science-based and more based on does it suspend disbelief? 
So if you think that a orbital precession cycle on the order of about 100,000 years believably justifies these mass extinction events, then yeah, go for it. For geocentricity, would it be possible the star is less massive than the planet and thus orbits around the planet? Like imagine a rocky planet the size of a star and a star the size of a planet. However, something tells me that's not possible. So unfortunately, this is not possible. Stars cannot be less massive than planets. If we were to create a rocky planet the size of even the smallest star, there would be so much mass in that object that it would functionally be a star. Thermonuclear fusion would begin, etc. It would be a star. If we were to take a star and shrink it down to the size of a planet, there wouldn't be enough mass there for thermonuclear fusion to begin, so it wouldn't be a star. It would be a planet. The cutoff points are something like this, up to about 13 Jupiter masses and you've got yourself a planet or planet-like object. From about 13 Jupiter masses to about 0.08 solar masses, you've got brown dwarfs. And from 0.08 solar masses onwards, you have stars. So unfortunately, no star-like planets and no planet-like stars. And that is that. Thank you all so much for watching this video and the main video. Massive thanks to go out to all the patrons, in particular, Johan Spadke, Spencer Brownlee, Alexander Roper, Andrew Pisha Hale, John Huyer, Ripta Passe, and World Anvil. Until next time, Edgar out.